All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Um, the members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. Thank you. Steve Revlack. Present. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Perfect. Um, and then from the town, uh, Rick Ballarelli. Rick, I know you're here somewhere. Here. Thanks, Christian. Thanks. Um, and then I don't, be I don't believe I've seen either um, Doug Heim or Jennifer Raitt. I'm not sure if either of them are coming. They may be coming a little later. Um, the person's appearing um, on behalf of 69 Epping Street, um, Derek and Emina Kelly. Okay, they're here, perfect. Um, person's appearing for 64 Brattle Street, uh, Stephen Doherty. Council <clears throat> uh, David, David Mack. Mack. Oh, perfect. And there are others as well. Okay, say thank you. Um, and then for Thorndike Place, uh, Paul Haverty. Here. Is here. Uh, Marta Nover. I am here. Thanks. Uh, Greg Lucas. He'll probably join in a little bit. Okay. I see he's on the admitted list. So. Okay. Yes. Yes. He's planning on joining. Definitely. Uh, Stephanie Kiefer. Don't actually see her on the list. Um, Scott Thornton. Present. Uh, sure. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that Ms. Kiefer is joining, uh, but probably a little later. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access is listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by our uh, ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care not to share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. We're starting this meeting this evening with an administrative item, the approval of minutes from the January 5th, 2021 public hearing. As this item relates to the operation of the board, we will be conducted with limited discussion by the public. The board will not take up any new business, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. Um, after this introduction, I'll go down the line of board members inviting each to provide comment, questions, or comments. So with that, um, I know that we have uh, comments submitted by uh, Steve Revlack, and I had some comments um, on the minutes. Rick, did you receive all of those? I did, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Much appreciated. I'll make those edits and get them um, loaded up to the permanent minutes. Are there other com other um, items regards to the minutes from the board? No, looking no. around everyone, I see no one. 
Uh, with that, can I have a motion to approve the minutes as amended? So moved. Thank Second. You. Thank you, Kevin. Um, just quickly do a roll call vote on that. Um, Roger? Aye. Patrick? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Stephen? Aye. And Sean? Aye. Wonderful. <clears throat> We're now turning to the first public hearing on tonight's agenda. Some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves, make their presentation to the board. We'll then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I'll open the meeting for public comment. So the first <clears throat> item on the Docket for hearings is docket number 3641, 69 Epping Street. So if the applicants could go ahead and unmute themselves and introduce themselves and let us know what you're looking to do. Sure, it's Derek Kelly and Amina Kelly, 69 Epping Street. Uh, our architect is here as well, uh, Mr. Greg Legault uh, is, is on the call as well. Um, so what we're looking to do, uh, we have an application for a special permit uh, to build uh, a vestibule uh, in the front of our house. Uh, currently, right now, there's no overhang for when we go in um, the front door. So this will uh, allow us uh, that overhang and also a front porch. Um, currently, we when we enter the house, we enter right into the basically the, the front stairs or the stairs that go upstairs. So we have no privacy either when we open the front door. If we're walking down the stairs, it's you're basically right at the front door. So this would just provide us um, a few feet of extra um, privacy. And so we're not walking right into the living room. Okay. And I see from your application, so the the request it's under section 539A because um, you can do up to 25 square feet by right, but because it's larger than that, you need to um, have a finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Correct. Um, I did have one question, um, <clears throat> which I'd like to actually ask Mr. Valarelli. So the combination of the new mudroom and the new porch extends 11 feet from the building, from the existing building. Yes. And under set in the bylaws, um, under the next paragraph, which is uh, 539B, there's unenclosed steps, decks and the like, which do not project more than 10 feet in the front yard or more than five feet in the side yard. Um, may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district in which the structure is built. So my question is, is the, is the front porch limited to 10 feet from the building, from the main part of the house, or is it limited to 10 feet from the front of the, um, the enclosed entryway? Uh, Mr. Chairman, without having that section of the zoning opening, I believe that a 10 <clears throat> open porch is allowed by right. Um, an enclosed vestibule greater than 25 square feet encroaching on the setback is allowed by special permit. Okay, I'm just going to quickly share the. So it's this paragraph B. So I'm saying that unenclosed steps, decks, yep. and the like. Right, so, which do not yeah. project more than 10 feet in the front yard. So my, my question is, does that 10 feet start at the house or does it start at the front of the proposed entryway? It starts at the house. At the house. Yes. Okay. Um, application.
So I apologize that it's sideways. Um, <clears throat> so the new mudroom is six feet and there's five feet for the new porch. So it's 11 feet, which is a foot beyond what the, the zoning bylaw allows. Um, so I think we need to request that you either reduce the dimension of the front porch, reduce the dimension of the new mudroom, or some combination of the two to bring that back to 10 feet. Um, would you agree, Mr. Valerelli? It's a little bit ambiguous uh, with respect to um, the projections into minimum yards. Okay. Uh, a vestibule that exceeds 25 square feet projects more than what's allowed by right um, is allowed by special permit. I'd have to dig into the zoning to see if there's any exceptions uh, to uh, that fact. Okay. So are you suggesting that if, if we're, uh, because we're 11 feet, then we would need variance as opposed to a special permit? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to trying to understand um, because it, the request is specifically for section A, not for sections A and B. Um, <clears throat> oh, I see. I mean, apart from that, I have absolutely no concerns whatsoever. Share. Are there going to open up to other questions from the board? Ms. Mills, no. Mr. Dupont, no. Mr. Hanlon, any questions? No. No. Mr. Revelak? Oh, you're on mute. Sometimes the keyboard shortcut works and sometimes it apparently <laughs> does not. Um, I, I shared the, the question you raised earlier uh, with respect to uh, the 10 foot projection and uh, the 11 feet, that's um, the combined mudroom and front porch. Mr. O'Rourke, any questions? Mr. Ford? Okay, I'll now open the, the meeting for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments should be taken only as it relates to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. I'll first ask members of the public who have identified themselves by logging in through Zoom who wish to speak to please digitally raise their hand by using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. Your audio and video, video should be unmuted and you'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions should be addressed to the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. We'll then request that those calling by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. When called upon, we'll follow the same procedure. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, the public comment period will be closed. Um, <clears throat> so I am looking at our list of attendees. I see none with their hand raised. <clears throat> going once, going twice. All right, so we will close public comment. All right. So for the board, how should we proceed? Mr. Chairman, can I offer some clarity in that section of the zoning bylaw? Yes, please. Okay, Mr. so I think the applicant is going for 539A, which um, involves enclosed spaces. Uh, 539B addresses unenclosed spaces such as open decks and alike.
the unenclosed spaces are restricted to 10 feet projecting in the front yard. Yeah. So is it, is it just a matter of, of adding the uh, section B to the application to get approval or is that would we have to well, I think refile? Uh, what I was going to no, I don't think you need to refile at all. I think I would we could administratively just indicate that you know if you wanted to leave the new mudroom at six feet, if you wanted to reduce the porch to four feet, then I think we're fine. Um, Mr. Chairman, not not to interrupt, but I wanted to ask one question as oh, I was looking at the drawings a little bit more. Um, the ten feet is from the face of the building. Is that right? That's correct. If you look at the if you look at the building section, I, I could see how it could be argued that it's ten feet from the outer extension of the face of the building, which is the second floor, which projects beyond. And so, if it was measured from the second floor, which is an overhang, yeah, it probably it probably stays within the ten foot threshold. That's correct. Yeah. But under so. Going back to section B, it's an unenclosed steps, decks, and the like. They do not project more than 10 feet in the front yard or more than five feet in the side yard beyond the line of the foundation wall. Yeah, uh, okay. So unfortunately, it does say foundation wall. I have no, I, I mm -hmm. got nothing else there. <laughs> I think we could ap approve with a condition that the combined depth of the mudroom and the porch, you know, comply with the restriction by, in, in section 539B. And then we just, we leave it to the applicant to work with the building department to determine whether they want to reduce the depth of the mudroom or they want to reduce the depth of the porch or split it between the two. And just, just for, so I'm clear, the, you know, since we're in this process already and in this hearing already, we can't, uh, you're saying if, if we left it at 11, we would need a, a variance as opposed to a special permit. That's why we can't add that. That's the way I'm seeing it, yeah. Okay, so so we wouldn't be able to just say, change it right now from a special permit to a variance. No, and you know because of the because of because of the variance requirements, um, there are much more stringent requirements than there for a special permit. I think you'd right. you'd have to come up with an argument for specifically why right. you're okay. unable to comply with this section of the zoning bylaw. Okay. Okay. So I, I don't want to speak for Derek and, and Amina, but it seems like you know cutting cutting that front porch back to four feet would be uh, you know amenable, and and we could uh, just definitely uh, uh, appreciate your uh, your suggestion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I I think that makes perfect sense. Perfect. Okay. So with that in mind, so then we would, one of the conditions with that would be that to comply with section 539B, the new porch reduced to four foot. Um, and then I think the board, we would at there was a, a memo that, um, Rick, do you know if the memo from the, um, from the Department of Planning and Community Development was distributed to the applicant? We did not see a, uh, an opinion for either of these cases tonight, Mr. Chairman. No, yeah. There's a, there was one posted for Epping Street, excuse me. If we could check with Nobis, uh, I, was uh, trying to chase that down and did not come across it. No, so Mr. Mr. Lee must have gotten that correspondence and posted it. Oh, okay. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. May I direct a question to Mr. Valorelli? Please, Mr. Mills. Mr. Valorelli, um, 
as proposed, would this be in compliance or is this uh, the 10 feet just for open deck or is there for a combined open deck and enclosed area? Well, uh, may I answer him, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. So projections into minimum yard addresses two situations. One situation is for enclosed spaces, such as vestibules, porches, that sort of thing. Um, the other part of uh, 5.3.9 addresses open decks, uh, unenclosed spaces. So um, according to projections into minimum yards A, which the applicant is seeking tonight, um, I don't see any language restricting that to what the board is entertaining with a 10 foot maximum projection. I see that only uh, entrances greater than 25 square feet and a couple of other conditions such as the projection off of the foundation wall uh, would, would be allowed by special permit. That answer your question, Mr. Mills? Yes, thank you, Mr. Valorelli. Right. <clears throat> so the, the Department of um, Planning and Community Development, their memo um, is in, in favor of the proposal. Their they had one concern, which was in regards to um, one of the forms that was submitted, which has the, is the, um, pardon me, I say, scroll, um, the dimensional and parking information sheet um, was only partly filled out. And they just wanted to confirm that by the creation of this new addition in the front, whether that it would not cause any other um, unforeseen nonconformities because the form wasn't complete. So I think all we would ask is that when you submit your final application that you submit an updated copy of the sheet with the, uh, with the additional information included um, and then you would also include um, a revised uh, floor plan with the with the, the modified dimension. Okay. So um, I would make a motion. I would um, so for Mr. Klein. Yes, please. Uh, just to to, cl uh, to clarify uh, clarification on what you just said in terms of the missing dimensions, you would uh, and unintentional nonconformities. We're really talking about open space here, I presume. We are, and it. Certainly, uh, just looking at it, it appears that they're not in any danger of um, of encroaching on anything. But I think we just the the document should be updated to include all information. Okay. Um, so for conditions, um, we have three standard conditions. Um, the first being that the plans and specifications provided to the board. Further permit shall be final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector. Um, connect with the application for zoning relief, no deviation during construction from the approved plans and specs without the express written approval of the zoning board of appeals. Uh, number two, the building inspector is notified to monitor the site and proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time. If there are violations present, an inspector of buildings shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaws under provisions of 40, uh, excuse me, chapter 40, section 21D of the state statutes and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the inspector of buildings may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action, also in accordance with section 3.1. Um, and number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Um, in addition, as we discussed, the applicant is to provide, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, number four, the applicant is to provide a revised and signed dimensional and parking information and open space gross floor area sheet, correcting any deficiencies discussed at the hearing the inspection services department for review. Um, number five, the applicant is to provide a revised construction drawing documenting changes discussed at the hearing to the inspection services department for review. And number six, to comply with section 539B, the new porch, we reduced it to four foot. Are there any other questions or concerns from the board? Seeing none, may I have a motion to so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second. second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. So motion to approve, we'll do it by a roll call of the active board members. <clears throat> Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. 
And the chair votes aye. That is a unanimous decision. You are approved. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hello. Yes. So this brings us. Can you call me back? Yeah, I'm. I'm in a meeting right now. Can you call? I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. Uh, this brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is docket number three six four two. Uh, 64 Brattle Street. Mr. Mack. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is David Mack. I'm an attorney at O'Connor, Carnarthen, and Mack in Burlington, Mass. at uh, 1 Vandegraaff Drive, Burlington. Uh, I'm here today uh, in support uh, of FTO Realty Trust, uh, which is the owner of 64 Brattle Street. I believe on the Zoom meeting, uh, Jim Mackey, uh, as the builder representative of FTO Realty Trust is on, and I believe also Cliff Rober, who's a surveyor, is on. Um, we're here um, in, with regard to an appeal of the determination of the uh, building inspector that uh, the demolition of the existing two-family structure on the property would render the lot non-buildable. Um, we respectfully believe that that is uh, not correct and that this um, proposed project is um, would be governed by section 8.1.3 of the ordinance as a reconstruction of a non-conforming structure. So a little bit of background, the, the property is, as mentioned, is in the R2 zone in uh, it's 64 Brattle Street. There's an existing structure that's been in place as we understand since somewhere around 1920. Um, and it's on a lot that has frontage on Brattle Street that is approximately 20 feet of frontage. Um, access has been always been by Brattle Street. It has, together with an easement of an additional 10 or 11 feet, um, a fairly wide driveway. The building is set back pretty far from the, the street. Um, uh, back when you know the, the building was constructed, uh, as far as we can tell, the uh, structure was always uh, within or low, less than 10 feet of the side set uh, side property line with 60 to 62 Brattle Street to the, I believe that's to the west. Um, and I just didn't note in our submittals, but I believe there's also a nonconformity in that it's less than 20 feet from the rear property line to the north. Um, this property used to be part of a bigger lot that had um, about 100 feet of frontage on Summer Street. Um, it never accessed this, the property again was never accessed by Summer Street. It was always by Brattle. Sometime in 19, I think in 1963, the, um, the lot was broken off to make another lot, which is known in the plans as K4 that had frontage on summer, and that rendered the existing lots, um, 64 Brattle Street with its house on it, having frontage only on Brattle Street, and as mentioned, about 19 feet of frontage. That was approved uh, in a subdivision that was approved by the Zoning Board in 1963, and I think that decision is attached as Exhibit D to our appeal papers. So what Mr. Mackey on behalf of FTO proposes to do is to demolish the existing two family structure and build a new two family structure in its place and eliminate both non-conformities, meaning the uh, side setback would move from eight feet from the side yard to a little bit more than 10 feet and from 15 feet or so from the rear setback to a little bit more than 20 feet, both making eliminating those nonconformities. Um, the, um, the proposed, and I believe that is at exhibit, um, 
uh, B, uh, or excuse me, C of our um, submittal shows the proposed plan. Uh, we submitted that to the building inspector and the building inspector was of the view that we cannot demolish the building and that by doing so it renders the lot non-buildable. And this is sort of a, a, um, an exercise in the, in the interplay between two sections of the zoning ordinance and, two, and, and the statute by which they're modeled, uh, section six of 40A. Um, section 8.1.3, which deals with alterations, reconstructions, extensions of non-conforming structures is modeled after um, the sec what's known as the second accept clause of the first paragraph of section six, which essentially says that if you have a non-conforming structure, you can extend it and, um, and you can extend it as of right if you don't increase the nonconformity. And if you do increase the nonconformity, you can do so, but you need a special permit from the zoning board to determine that the extension of the nonconformity is not substantially detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, that's the section we believe this is governed by. And because the proposed uh, reconstruction after demolition would eliminate nonconformities that we believe that it's a project as of right. Um, the building inspector determined that section 5.4.2.B, which is modeled after the fourth paragraph of section six of the statute applies. And that section basically says that if you have a lot you can build on a lot as long as there is 50 feet of frontage and 5,000 square feet of area. We have the area, but we don't have the frontage. And so we believe that the, um, the critical point about the ordinance is that in section 8.1.3, which governs non-conforming structures, it allows the reconstruction of such structures and doesn't merely allow renovation alteration. We believe the case law that interprets these two sections of the ordinance, excuse me, of the statute, meaning the second accept clause of section one of paragraph of sec, of sec, paragraph one of section six and paragraph four of section six provides that if you have a non-conforming structure and you demolish it, and the ordinance allows reconstruction of demolished buildings, then as long as you are not increasing the nonconformity, you may build um, as long as you don't, as long as you don't wait the abandonment period of two years. So that's where the dispute is. We understand that this might be the way that the ordinance has been interpreted for quite some time. And obviously that's, that is what it is. But we believe that that's what the law provides. And we are requesting that this board determine that the building inspector erred in holding that the raising or, or demolition of the non-conforming structure would prohibit um, you know, building on this lot at all. So that's, uh, it's kind of academic and exercise. Um, and I hope I, was as clear as I could be, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Are there questions from the board? Mr. Ford. Um, <clears throat> I'm not seeing it in the documents. The size of the, the, um, the, the uh, house before and after, how, what is it right now and what is it proposed to be? Um, I believe Mr. Mackey might be able to answer that quickly. If you give me a second, I can find that answer. I got to turn um, turn off my camera and go to a different screen. Um, let's see here. Oh, I think I got it here. So the um, existing um, uh, I believe it's uh, 1,246 uh, square feet per unit, I believe, and it's proposed to increase to 1680 um, 
I believe that's correct. I don't think that it exceeds any floor area ratio. It's all compliant with the side and uh, setbacks. Uh, the height would be increased by two feet, but still below the 35. The open space is increased. Um, essentially, it turns two, the two units that are uh, one on top of each other to two that are side by side and makes it a little taller. And, um, you know, Mr. Um, Mr. Roger, uh, Rober is also on the line too, if, if you have any questions on that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Please, Mr. DuPont. Uh, so, Mr. Matt, did I hear you say that you believe that the ordinance, ordinance provides for or allows demolition and then reconstruction thereafter? Yes, I believe that if you look at section 8.1.3, um, which uh, I'm going to it now on my screen, I can share my screen if it would help. I, um, I, I have that in front of me. I just, I'm looking for some reference to demolition. It, it says no alteration, reconstruction extension or structural changes to a single or two family residential sector, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm saying that as interpreted by the courts, and I'm in particular focused on the dial away decision, that the significance of the word reconstruction means that you may demolish and rebuild a non-conforming structure. And that if this ordinance had simply said no alteration extension of or structural change to, then we'd have a different issue. But because the language reconstruction as the court found in dial away is included, it means that you may demolish and reconstruct a prior non-conforming structure as long as you do not increase the non-conforming nature of it. Or if you do, you get a, um, a finding from the board that the reconstruction will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighbor. Okay. So it doesn't say specifically, you may demolish, but the use of the word reconstruction when construed in conjunction with chapter 40A <coughs> section six and the first paragraph and specifically the second accept clause, which grandfathers these structures is where you get to piece it all together. So I, I have a couple of observations. One is that I do believe in the past when we've dealt with reconstruction, and if someone has a different memory of this, I'd be happy to hear. I think we've, we've thought of it in terms of damage or destruction. Uh, and, and I think that if you go and you look up the word reconstruction, you'll find that that's part of the definition. It sort of includes the concept that something was damaged or it was destroyed. And so my memory is that at times when we've dealt with reconstruction, there's been some sort of a, a loss such as a fire. And then the second observation is that this would seem to me to say that anybody who has a lot um, that wants to demolish their building in its entirety, even if it doesn't meet those requirement minimums of 5,000 square feet and 50 feet of frontage, they can just do so. And, and that seems to be contrary to the way we have looked at these types of cases in the past. Can I, can I comment in of course. the order that you, that you mentioned? The Please. first one is, I believe that there's a separate provision in section 8.1 that deals with uh, reconstruction after a casualty event. So I believe that this, the, there is a separate provision that governs that, and that's not this one. And I believe that in your scenario, that um, that that would be true. But but if you have but but it only applies if you have a non-conforming structure that's on there. If you have a conforming structure um, that's within the setback, and um, you know, and you then demolish it, I believe that you could rebuild it as long as your 
fully compliant with zoning. But I think what this does is this is this is grandfathered because of the section six of the zoning ordinance, because I believe that I don't know when the side setback uh, limitations came into effect, but I know that I believe that the zoning ordinance as a whole didn't come into effect till the late 20s. This this building was already in existence and in proximity to the side lot line as of that time. So I think the later zoning rendered it non-conforming. And, um, and so I think the provision that the building inspector was relying upon applies to vacant lots. So that, and, and I believe that's how the court in, is interpreted. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't accept the proposition that if you demolish a property that you've got a vacant lot. I, I, I do not believe, if you have a property in, in, that has a non-conforming structure on it and you demolish it, if your ordinance allows reconstruction of non-conforming structures, which your ordinance does, then I believe it's allowed. If your ordinance read something different, which is what was at issue in dial -away, it didn't have, it noted that it's the importance of that language, that if it just said alteration or extension, we wouldn't have this argument. That's my point. Thank you. The que um, question I have is, what do you consider the difference between construction and reconstruction? I think construction is something like a, a um, an addition. Uh, I think the words here is alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change. That's the that's the the language that's triggered. So alteration is something where you're changing whether it's making an um, um, you're changing the um, perhaps you're, ex you're you're changing the uh, the location, um, but not raising it. Reconstruction is you're taking it down and rebuilding it. Extension is adding a, um, you know, is, is, is putting an addition on, um, whether it's by height or by width. And structural change, I guess you're taking down a wall and, and, and changing a wall to it. But I don't, I don't believe the word construction is part of the ordinance. It's reconstruction or alteration or extension. And again, this this is tailored toward that section of the statute. That's what it follows. Because the, you know, to my ear, and I think Mr. Ford sort of alluded to it as well, is reconstruction makes it sound like you are constructing it again, um, which would be that you know if you had the house and you took it off and you put that house back, that would be a last. You could extend it, you could alter it, you could do various things, but it's still effectively that building. Um, but what you're proposing is redeveloping the site. You're proposing removing the existing building and doing an entirely new project on the on the site, which to me does not sound like reconstruction at all. It sounds like redevelopment, which is not covered, obviously, under um, under this statute. Yeah, I, I understand that. And that, that could be a different word that's used. But if, if I'd be permitted to just share my screen for a moment, I can put in the, lang the language that I'm, I'm reading from this dial away decision, which was mm -hmm. a mass appeals court decision that says the first paragraph of section six um, and the second accept clause addresses reconstruction. Right. And it says, and, and the demolition of existing buildings and erection of a new building for the same non-conforming use was not permitted where the bylaw contains the words alteration and extension but not reconstruction. So the use of reconstruction means you can demolish and rebuild. That's what reconstruction means according to this, the court, the appeals court as it construed um, the, the applicable provision of the statute. And, and the, the ordinance, to the extent that it didn't include reconstruction um, is a different ordinance than Arlington. If Arlington had did not have the word reconstruction, mm -hmm. we would be limited to an extension or alteration, whatever other words were used in the ordinance. 
but because it has reconstruction, we believe we're permitted to raise the building and rebuild it as of right, as long as we eliminate non-conformities or keep them the same. Now, maybe that the proposed project, when we look at it in more detail with actual plans, may, may um, you know, may require a special permit, but I don't believe that the demolition of the building makes the, makes the lot non-buildable. That's the issue that the building inspector and we uh, differ on. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair? Mr. Mr. Adlai. Yes, um, I also fought with the use of the word reconstruction in our bylaw. Uh, we do not provide an explicit definition. Rather, we refer you know, all undefined terms to Merriam-Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. And Merriam-Webster's Unabridged Dictionary uh, essentially provides the same definition you gave uh, to build something again. So just you know, with that in mind, the idea of reconstructing a house uh, would more or less entail building it within the same footprint in the same place on the lot. And I'd like to ask, Ms. through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask Mr. Mack if the dial away decision involved a change in either the, uh, the two dimensional envelope of the building or where it was situated on the lot. Matt? I, I believe, I think the dial away decision um, is, is points out the significance of the use of the word reconstruction. That case did not actually involve the demolition of a garage and then the, the owner waited for many, many years before trying to rebuild. So it was an issue about abandonment. So that's not, you know, but, but what, the, what the court did was, was, um, was uh, evaluate or analyze the language of the statute and point out the significance of the words, alteration, extension, reconstruction, and the significance of those via in terms of demolition. Um, so the, I, I point to the dial away decision for that purpose. It was not the, it's not a case involving, um, uh, you know, demolition and reconstruction within, within the abandonment period. Um, that's, that was the issue in that they demolished a garage and then I think it might've been decades later tried to rebuild and there was an abandonment issue. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I wonder if uh, Mr. Mack could be permitted to put the relevant provision of the uh, dial away decision on the screen. I, I can Fine, try. Do you, have the, do you have the green share screen? I do. Option? Okay. Um, let me see if I can do that here. Testing my the limits of my capabilities, but let's see if I can. So, Mr. Chair, while <clears throat> Mr. Mackey does that, I mean, the other thing that I does that show up here, or no? I don't see it yet. Not I think it. I have to. I share. I have to share the screen. I think you have to. Mr. Valarelli, can you assist Mr. Mack in that? Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Mack has had the ability to share a screen from the. Oh, I think I got yeah. it now. I think I got it now. Let me bring it over now, if I can find it. Uh, not now or no? No, now we're seeing our zoning bylaw. Uh, oh, okay. I just got the wrong screen. I'm sure wrong side. Okay, now you're seeing the uh, dial away. Not yet. Still, the uh, it hasn't changed. No, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Oh, boy. Uh, let's see if I can figure this out. I'm sorry about that. You had just wanted to bring up the dial away decision? Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Thank you. I thought I did it right. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Mr. Mack, if you could direct us to the language, the passage that you're deciding. Sure. Um, if you look at the, let's see. Uh, yeah, right there where, where I'm hovering, the first paragraph of 40A is set forth in the margin and the second except right there, yep. Whoops. Yeah, Wait, right it's there. That, <laughs> that's exactly the language right there where it cites the planning board decision there versus Miller, uh, explain, planning board of Reading versus Board of Appeals of Reading. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is the, in what way is, what is the importance of, what was the importance of whether or not what a reconstruction was in that case? What was, what is, what was the question the court had before it that made that, def, that definition important to it? I think what they were trying to determine was the, which provision in section six, either paragraph one or paragraph four applied. Paragraph one being um, uh, applying to uh, prior non-conforming structures and paragraph four applying to vacant lots. And what, what paragraph, uh, uh, what the court dealt with was said that paragraph one applies to project to properties on which a structure exists and paragraph four applies to vacant lots and that paragraph one applies even if you demolish a building as long as the word reconstruction or rebuilt is part of the ordinance and that's the provision that's set forth here and was that was that true in that case Again, I think that what happened in this case was that there was an abandonment issue because of the length of time that passed um, between the demolition of the garage and the and the and the re and the request to rebuild. So, I'm trying to figure out in sort of old law school thing whether yeah. or not the the court's comments on reconstruction are part of the holding of the case, or whether yeah. essentially it's dictum. If you could you explain why it's part of the holding of the case? Right. So if you scroll down a little further in the decision, there's a um, there's a provision that's that right there. Application of Section six, paragraph one to reconstruction of a single and two family residence. I see. OK, because in this or in this ordinance, it didn't have the word reconstruction in it. So. The, the court assumed that if it did have the word reconstruction in it, and that the result might be different, but it didn't, and therefore the result is what it was. Right. Uh, right. So in, in that case, they it was not they were not really required to wrestle with what reconstruction might mean because it wasn't present in the ordinance at all. Well, I think it was important. Uh, they didn't have to deal with it because of the abandonment issue. They ultimately ruled that there was an abandonment, but I think it, the holding is 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 a holding that was essential to the to the court's decision. And I think it's since been applied. Um, and, and certainly, the case law the case is cited for the proposition that Section One applies to. Um, existing lots with, with, with a structure on it and section four on which 5.4 of your ordinance is modeled applies to vacant lots. Yeah, what I'm trying to do is see what, what other authority is there besides this case mm -hmm. and in the various other ones that you've cited um, that require determining what exactly a reconstruction is. One, one, one account, your account really is that if you have a building and you remove it and replace it with another building that's more or less in the same place or that's on the same lot, that that's a reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there have been other ideas of, of what a reconstruction is, most of which seem to me to be consistent with the dial away case um, that are narrower than that. And our practice has always been to mm -hmm. uh, apply something narrower than that. Uh, and so I'd like to see what other authority there is that 
uh, takes the very broad and takes in the sense that it's important that it had to focus on that as opposed to one of the narrower ideas that has been used in Arlington before um, that sort of forces us to take a broader view than we're used to. I think the other decision that is commonly cited for this is the Willard decision, um, which is also, I think it's referenced in Dial Away. Uh, it's in your brief, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the two decisions that, that uh, squarely hold in, in my view that that section one applies, uh, section four upon which this 5.4 uh, uh, is modeled applies only to vacant lots and that you have to look at the specific language of the ordinance to determine what you can do after you um, demolish a building. If you demolish it and reconstruction is allowed under the, the, the grandfather clause, paragraph one of section six, then you're allowed to do it as long as you don't increase the nonconformities. And I guess so, the, I mean, the problem is, is that that seems to sidestep the basic issue of what a reconstruction is. And Mr. Revelak, for example, suggested a, a narrower definition of that. What is it in these cases that would be inconsistent with Mr. Revelak's view of the statute? Well, I think that the uh, my point is that the, the dial away um, I think the plain meaning of reconstruction is that you put something back up that that you destroy. And I think that's the way dial away defines reconstruction. It's not in the ordinance. The ordinance doesn't mm. define it. And you know, I believe that that when you don't have a definition, you the, the board needs to be guided by the court decisions. And it's clear in my view in dial away and the Willard case that reconstruction means rebuilding after demolition. Um, I don't think it, I think the issue of the location of the, of the building has to do with the a nonconformity and whether you're increased in nonconformity or not. Mr. Chairman. Was that, Mr. Was that you, Mr. DuPont? Well, I, I did. I didn't want to trouble you, but where you started, where you originally scrolled to in the dial away case, there was a reference in what was being cited to a non-conforming use as opposed to a non-conforming structure. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to put that up? Because I'd like to have that explained. Not a non-conforming use is, is when you're using a property for a use that is not allowed in the district. No, so I, if you I, had if you had like a you know a hotel there. I understand that, but there's a reference in what you were citing, I believe, to a non-conforming use. And I'd just like to go back and see what that language was, because it caught my eye and then we moved on. Mm -hmm. um, just quickly here. Um, dial away. This is the what you're referring to? Yeah, so it says, and, and I, I haven't processed this, so I don't, don't know exactly what to make of it, but it says the demolition of an existing building's and erection of a new building for the same non-conforming use. So we're not dealing with the non-conforming use Correct. here. I'm not sure that this is really uh, determinative in any way, but I think that that needs to be read and considered at least to see if this is really applicable. Are there other questions from the board time? I'll go ahead and stop share. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have a question, but I guess it's a comment to, to uh, maybe to uh, respond to um, how Mr. Mack is using reconstruction. I, I think if you were to say that um, you were going to demolish the building and reconstruct it, um, moving it over to, you know, um, give it the, the 
the dimensions needed for the side and the back, but build it in basically the same shape and size that was there, I would agree that that would be reconstruction. I think the problem that some of us might be having is just that it's um, taking some liberty with the use of the word reconstruction. And the, and I'm not sure how to wrestle with that one. So uh, I, I feel like it doesn't um, follow the meaning either of reconstruction, at least as you're proposing it. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Dupont. I would just like to point out that under the statute, the appeal itself does not have to be decided for 100 days. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that if it is the uh, sense of the members of the board that we need more time to be able to process this, we should take that time to make sure that we are uh, getting what we need in terms of information and interpretation. I just want to point that out. So I was going to recommend at this point that we do um, open this up to public comment because I know there's at least one person who's been waiting a considerable amount of time to speak. Um, so with that, I will open the, uh, the public comment period. Um, again, if you are participating by Zoom, if you go to the participants tab, um, there is a raise hand feature there that you should be able to access. Um, if you are calling in, it's star nine um, should activate the same. Um, on the screen. And so the first raised hand was uh, Crystal Reddy. Chris, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I've heard a lot of talk um, this evening about uh, non conforming structure. Um, it seems to me the discussions missed the bigger point, is, and that is that you've got a grossly non conforming lot here. And, um, and that has like serious implications. I don't think have been fully discussed. Um, I'm not sure what your board was doing 60 years ago, and, and I certainly don't hold any of you responsible for it, but it sure seems to me by allowing the subdivision of the lot that fronted on, on Summer Street, they engaged in, uh, in infectious invalidity, as it is so-called, by creating a non-conforming lot. And the fact that the board approved a lot at the time does not make it conforming. It is a non-conforming lot um, because of that absence of frontage. You know, it's less than 20 feet. And also it's, it's non-conforming under the existing bylaw, both for the existing house and the proposed structure, and that it doesn't meet the minimum 50 foot lot width from the front property line up to the face of the building. So in both those cases, you know, you've got this, um, this non-conforming lot. And so this isn't just a matter of, of rebuilding a non-conforming structure. Certainly if you have a buildable lot with 6,000 square feet and 60 foot of frontage, you can tear down anything and build a new house as if you're building from scratch on a lot that has never been developed before. That's not the case here. And uh, I would also suggest that the board needs to look more broadly at some of the legal decisions um, for example, um, Bjorklund versus ZBA of Norwell, which I believe is a more relevant um, uh, example of case law where you had a non-conforming law and you had a family or developer who wanted to do a complete teardown and build a much bigger house. That's what we have here. And you can call it reconstruction. You can call it anything you want. But the fact is it's a complete teardown. And what the developer or the attorney wants to do is claim that you've got this grossly non-conforming lot, you can remove the house, you can remove the foundation and build as if you've got a completely conforming lot. Well, I, that has never been the way the bylaw has been interpreted in this town. And I think you, you need to uh, also seriously consider the implications of that approach um, in places like where I live in East Arlington where the vast majority of lots are non-conforming, either because of frontage or lot size lot area or both. Um, you know, I, I just don't see how the proponent can suggest that building on such a lot can move forward with no relief from your board. It, the bylaw has never been interpreted that way. I believe the building inspector, Mr. Byrne, got it exactly right, and so did those he consulted with. So I will leave it at that, but I, I certainly hope you don't move forward to approve this as um, 
as the applicant is rec recommending or requesting tonight. Thank you. Mr. Loretti, if you could just repeat the, the name of the court case you cited. Uh, I believe it's pronounced it's Bjorklund, B-J-O-R-K-L-U-N-D versus ZBA of Norwell, 450 Mass 357. Three, five, seven. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, the next hand I saw was uh, Mr. Don Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, I'd like to call the board's attention to the fact that there's precedence for just this sort of thing in Arlington. Um, first, there's 89 Robbins Road, which this board reviewed three years ago. Uh, very similar situation. It lacks the required frontage. Uh, it has non-conforming yard setbacks. And a third strike against it is that the lot area was non-conforming, was insufficient um, for an R1 district. And this board gave approval. I don't know if it was a special permit or a variance or what, but it gave approval for the owner to completely demolish the existing house and build a new one, which didn't fall into the same footprint um, of the previous one. The second precedent is much more current. It's 11 Arnold Street. Uh, this one is non-conforming because it doesn't have the proper front yard setback. It has insufficient lot area and far more serious than all these is it's a non-conforming use. It's putting in a duplex into a R1 zone. Um, I haven't been able to find a record of a ZBA hearing on this. Apparently this was simply approved at the building inspector level. Uh, now to turn to a little bit of a U-turn, getting back to 64 Brattle, I've noticed that there's a another serious nonconformity which hasn't been mentioned this evening, and that has to do with parking. Uh, I don't know if I have it correct, but I don't believe that front yard parking is allowed, that the required off-street parking has to be either in the side, the rear yard, or um, in a garage underneath the building, like the present structure has. Um, and instead, they've produced they have created a large parking lot area off to the side in the front yard, which uh, looks like it's probably 25 or more feet wide. It certainly isn't a driveway leading to a legal off street parking uh, spot. So just a few more things to throw into your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. I believe on the, on the parking, he does. Of course, we don't have a specific project in, in, in front of us, but there is a garage there and there's a, uh, there will be two garages um, on uh, underneath this, this structure. And there's uh, a turnaround now, right, with, with ample parking. But, um, so, you know, we, we have not addressed the parking issue because it's not a specific project um, on the table, only the issue of whether it can be raised and reconstructed. Okay, thank you. Um, next, I see uh, is David Damon. Hi, David Damon, 54 Brattle Street. Um, I just have a few brief comments. First, um, I support those who are concerned with the term reconstruction. My comments are, um, are there um, maximum sizes allowable for reconstruction? Um, if I look at the FAR, it's almost double, going from 34% to 61%. <clears throat> and with that, and with any additional um, uh, site coverage, I'm concerned about the um, impervious surfaces that may be um, uh, developed on the lot. So I'd like to know if there are um, maximum sizes allowable for reconstruction. Mr. Chair? Uh, Mr. Revelak. I, I can take that if you'd like. Please. So, um, so basically, with regards to building a new building, um, I think the part of the bylaw that's probably that may be most relevant is Section Five One. It, it's a it's it's just one sentence, so I'll just read it. 
uh, no building or structure shall be erected and no building or structure or land or water area shall be used for any purpose or in any matter except in accordance with this bylaw. So the size limits are effectively dictated by the uh, table of dimensional and density regulations. Um, so if you're, you know, because, you know, definition of reconstruction aside, the more general, more general is how big of a building can you build? As big as the bylaw lets you build. Um, once you tear down a building and you build a new one, you know it's generally, generally the, you know the current bylaw that takes effect. And regarding impervious surface surfaces, uh, there is there is nothing in our zoning bylaw that regulates the amount of impervious surface on a lot. There is a stormwater bylaw which. Um, you know, applies when impervious, the impervious area is increased by 350 square feet or more. But, um, you know, that's, that's essentially it. And I don't believe that any of the, um, you know, if, if constructed in accordance with the, you know, preliminary proposed plans, although they are preliminary, they do not violate any of the, um, any of those uh, limitations. Okay, thanks for the um, uh, definition. It just, um, in my closing, I'll just say that it does seem that, you know, if you're increasing <clears throat> the size of the buildable structure by 2,000 square feet, um, if I read that correctly, and you're going from <clears throat> a fairly narrow um, west facing facade to something that's 50 feet long, uh, it's, it's redevelopment, it's not reconstruction. But thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comments or questions in regards to this application? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Uh, hello? Oh, hello? Yep. Oh, sorry, I did not. There you are. <laughs> Please go ahead um, and um, if you could introduce yourself, uh, name and address. Yes, uh, Lauren Hooks Bud, 60 Brattle Street. And uh, I'm the butter this uh, property. Uh, I think most of the questions uh, have been uh, asked already, but uh, I'm just wondering a little bit about the issue of uh, parking. And uh, Mr. Mack indicated that uh, the parking would be under the uh, under the existing structure as it is now, I believe. Uh, there are no plans to extend that parking. Is that, is that true? Um, I, I don't think, I mean, first of all, there's no particular proposal other than the um, preliminary plans would be the garage each unit um, uh, underneath two sides by side each I I don't think the parking would change and I think it beats all the applicable criteria. So but again, uh, if we if we go through, I mean if this if we are permitted to go forward if versus the decision of the building we would then have to submit of course set of a, a, a building permit which uh, you know would test all of these points. And um, then that, you know, if it doesn't, then we'd have to get other, other relief would be uh, needed, such as a permit, but only the wood. But the issue that we believe is at the table is whether the raising of the building uh, would render the lot non building. Okay, so the issue of uh, the of ex say extending the parking would not uh, that uh, that information in terms of uh, extending the lot uh, line or not lot line but that would not even be considered. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure I'm following, but I don't believe that uh, that. There's any non-conformity relating to parking, at least that I've been made aware of, and there's no extension of that. So, so I, I just want to 
uh, make sure that your proposal for the uh, 1680 square feet uh, that is uh, does that include the uh, parking itself or not? I think that's the size of the square footage of the unit. Um, but again, so specific said, plans would have to lay that out for the building department. If any particular, we haven't even applied for a building permit yet. We had a preliminary information. So there, I, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what's, uh, what's happening here with, but currently it's 1246 square feet and you're proposing 1680 square feet. Is that correct? Um, I, Believe so. Maybe Jim, you could answer that. You can unmute yourself or Cliff. Uh, the current house is uh, 963 feet per floor. And the uh, proposed house would have. Um, 1500 feet per floor, I believe. So I, I believe that would give you the numbers you're looking for. Does that answer your question, sir? Um, well, for the time being. Okay. All right, are there any other, see no hands raised on the Zoom participants will have, and I see no one waving vigorously. Um, so with that, I will close public comment. Um, to Mr. Uh, Mr. DuPont's point, um, I know there's some questions that I would have for council uh, before we render a decision. So um, unless there's an objection, I'd like to um, continue this um, for two weeks um, to have an opportunity to speak with council. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I think that we have, we have at least by statute more time than that. I'm, we we could do it for two weeks and see what happens. Mr. Heim is is a busy person, and uh, I just want to make sure that that we allow sufficient time to actually get an answer rather than have serial extensions. Mm, certainly, um, I believe I do need to uh, to continue though to a date certain. Is that correct? Your knowledge? I don't actually know in this particular case. Mm -hmm. Mr. DuPont, do you know? I, I don't know for certain, but I was just going to add that the 100 days that we have, and somebody can check my math, brings us to Sunday, March 21st. So I realized that that wouldn't be the hearing date, so that we would mm -hmm. at the latest have to do it somewhere in March. And I do agree that I think that we should give ourselves enough time. And I'm not sure two weeks is sufficient. So I'd, I'd prefer to see something more in the vicinity of four and see whatever the next meeting is. And I do think that we would have to give it a date certain how mm -hmm. we're going to continue. Well, we do have a hearing scheduled for February 9th. So June 26th would be, we have a hearing scheduled for June 26th and a hearing scheduled February 9th. So would you be more comfortable requesting February 9th? For me, the answer would be yes. Okay. Me too. Okay. All right, then I move that um, we continue this hearing to uh, Tuesday, February 9th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Okay. Um, Mr. O'Rourke? Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Mills? Aye. 
and the chair votes aye. So this one is in, it's being continued. Rick, can you handle the paperwork in the background? Yes, I will, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I will send the continuance form via DocuSign. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank everyone on the call for their patience. Uh, we're now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place. Um, if there's any members of the board who need a minute or two to grab something, uh, grab something to drink, uh, please go ahead and do so. Um, we're just going to quickly go through the some ground rules for effective and clear conduct for tonight's business. Um, this evening's discussion will focus on the traffic impact study and related issues and reviews. Uh, the submitted documents are available as an attachment to the posted agenda under item number five. The impact study was discussed at a public meeting of the Arlington Transportation Advisory Committee on Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. Um, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves and make a short presentation to the board, to be followed by a short presentation by the board's peer review engineer. I will then invite the Transportation Advisory Committee to comment on the study and the review. Uh, members of the board will then have an opportunity to ask what questions they have on the information that's been presented. And after the board's questions have been addressed, I will open the meeting for public comment. So with that in mind, um, Ms. Kiefer. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, as, um, as was just stated, we are here this evening to present to you our um, traffic impact assessment and um, pretty much without further ado, I'm going to turn over the presentation to our traffic engineer, Scott Thornton and, and uh, Derek Roach of uh, Vaness. And, um, and we can take your questions if you have it at the conclusion of that, or if you want to wait until the conclusion of um, the beta presentation, however the board prefers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, this is Scott Thornton with Vanessa and Associates. Could I share my screen, please? He's good to go, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rick. You're all set, Mr. Thornton. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, thank you for hearing us tonight. My name's Scott Thornton. I'm with Vanessa Associates. I'm here with Derek Roach from my office, and we prepared the traffic impact assessment for the project. Um, as you mentioned, there have been a number of hearings for the project, but this is really the first one to focus on traffic following completion of the traffic study. We've been in consultation with the town, uh, with the town's peer consultant. As you mentioned, we appeared in front of the Arlington Transportation Advisory Committee, and we've received comments from both peer consultants and the TAC. Uh, what I'd like to do is provide an overview of our findings to date, uh, present some aspects of the traffic assessment, and um, let you know what our next steps are. And then, as you mentioned, we'll, we'll hear from the, uh, from the town's peer consultant. I thought it'd be helpful to provide an overview of the process, which is identified on this next slide. Uh, the standard process for traffic impact assessments or TIAs involves the collection of data from current or existing conditions, projections out to a future design year, in this case, 2027, to create a no build scenario, an estimate of project trip generation, uh, development of the future 2027 year conditions with the project, which is the build scenario, which includes uh, the project traffic volumes, an analysis of traffic impacts and delays at intersections, identification of mitigation and measures to minimize the project's impacts, and then review by town staff. In this case, Arlington is fortunate to have their own uh, traffic committee, as well as review by a third party peer consultant who is a traffic engineer working for the town, but funded by the applicant. Uh, the next slide shows the site plan with uh, vehicular access provided at the intersection of Little John Street and Dorothy Road. Development is proposing 176 units with 239 parking spaces. In addition, there's 144 covered bicycle spaces provided in the parking garage. 
Pedestrian access and circulation is shown on these paths that connect out to Dorothy Road. No access is proposed across the undeveloped areas to either the Minuteman bikeway or to the Route 2 pedestrian overpass. This next slide shows the site plan in context with the study area and in relation to area streets and transportation facilities. You can see the site borders Route 2, which is just to the south of the site and the neighborhood with Dorothy Street, Little John Street and Margaret Street. Uh, to the east is Alewife Brook Parkway. To the south is the MBTA Alewife Station. Also south of Route 2 are some residential developments in Cambridge that were recently constructed and occupied, including the Vauxhall 2 development, which is located uh, in this area. And we'll get to more discussion of the Vox on to development on another slide. So this next slide shows the study area that was selected for the project. And you can see the locations on Lake Street that were identified for study, which were recommended by Beta Group, the town's peer consultant. This includes uh, the ramps with uh, Route 2 and Lake Street to the west, extending through Wilson Ave, Little John Street, Homestead Road, Birch Street with Alfred Road, Margaret Street with Lake, uh, Lake, Hills, Lake Hill Ave, Miniman Bikeway, Brooks Avenue, Alta Mass Ave, uh, and also uh, the intersections of, there's, there's four signalized intersections of Route 2 with uh, Route 16. These locations were chosen to measure the project traffic increases and relative effects of the project. Uh, there are peak hour turn restrictions at Wilson, Little John and Homestead. Um, there are no entering restrictions at Birch or at Margaret Street. And there's no, there's no exiting restrictions at any of those locations. Uh, just to be clear, we are not proposing or advocating for the removal of any of the turn restrictions that are present. Um, these locations all operate with considerable delay for motorists exiting the neighborhood with queues of between one and four vehicles during the weekday morning and weekday evening peak hours. Oh, can't find my cursor. There we go. Um, I mentioned the estimation of project trips, and this is typically done using Institute of Transportation Engineer Statistics contained in the Trip Generation Manual. The Trip Generation Manual is a collection of counts of similar facilities in different land uses that's been compiled by traffic engineers going back for at least 40 to 50 years. This manual is the standard source for estimation of trips for developments and it's required use by most states and municipalities for development of trip generation information. For this analysis and this land use, the critical time periods are the weekday daily, the weekday morning peak hour and the weekday evening peak hour. The ITE trips are categorized based on a mode split which accounts for different types of commuting methods that residents may use. In this case, we have, we have SOV trips, which are single occupant vehicle trips, HOV trips, which are high occupant vehicle or carpool trips. We have transit trips, we have bike trips, we have walk trips, and we have other trips. And the percentages of these commuting types are applied to the ITE trips. Use of a mode split is appropriate in this case due to the presence of alternative transportation facilities, including the bikeway, the alewife station, and proximity to other uses and, and also ongoing transportation trends in the area. This results in a total vehicle trip estimation of 27 trips in the morning peak hour and 33 trips in the evening peak hour. The peak hour totals are the most appropriate here as these are what the traffic analyses are based on. So the mode splits that we use are based on data from the Voxon 2 development. And initially we discussed the use of the Voxon 2 mode split data with the town's peer review consultant. 
the Voxon 2 development was considered by us to be a similar development, similar in size, similar in location, similar access uh, to the bikeway and to Alewife Station as Thorndike Place. Um, mode split data for this development, for the Voxon 2 development, is required to be collected by the City of Cambridge. So in this case, residents must submit surveys each year indicating how they travel during a given week for a number of different trip types, work uh, from home to work, from home to school, from home to shopping or medical visits. Uh, in terms of comparison with the census data for the same East Arlington um, area that the project is located in, the Voxon 2 data is similar in terms of single occupant vehicle splits, transit splits, and bike splits. Uh, we have received some comments from, from the town's peer consultant and from the TAC questioning the use of the, of the, of the walk and bike trips. Um, given that there's a percentage, there's a, there's a potential for some of the Vox walking trips to be made to the nearby Discovery Park office complex. So this may account for the total. Uh, in terms of, of biking trips, the bike trips, uh, commuting by bike is pretty clear in Cambridge. Uh, and it's clear enough that it, it's distinct from commuting via just, uh, just transit modes. But in terms of, of making adjustments to the walk and other trip types uh, for the Vox on two data to be consistent with what was observed for the, for the census track data. If we do adjust those trips, or those mode splits um, and apply the additional trips that would be, uh, that would come out of the, of the walking category to, uh, to the vehicle trips, the single occupant vehicle uh, trip type in this case, it results in a, in a net increase of four trips in the morning and five trips in the evening, which is, which is a minimal increase um, based, on the, based on the totals for the uh, site that we've, that we've calculated. In terms of the overall assessment, and I'm trying to move along because I know you have um, uh, beta and possibly the TAC to, to present as well, but, but the project vehicle trips represent um, one additional vehicle every two minutes or so during the peak morning and evening peak hours. Uh, the project related traffic increases outside of the study area are between 0.1 and 0.8% during those same peak hours. Uh, the previous analysis, which was done for Thorndike Play for the previous iteration of, of Thorndike Place in 2014, uh, was for 207 units with estimates of mode split based on the census data at that time. Um, and at that time, it was it was 2010 data that was being reviewed and uh, there wasn't as much um, priority as I would say uh, that was placed on alternative or sustainable transportation as is currently the case. Um, so the current project at 176 units is smaller, more accurate mode split data based on the days of the similar developments. Uh, we're looking at a between a 60 and 64 uh, percent reduction in vehicle trips between the previous analysis and the current traffic study. No changes in overall level of service due to the project, and the proposed parking supply meets the town of Arlington requirements and is consistent with industry standards. In terms of project mitigation, and, and we're we are still working on this. Um, but we were aiming it at TDM measures to try to continue to reduce the use of passenger vehicles. Uh, we think that the site's proximity to the bikeway uh, and the Alewife station are, are going to be really the main drivers in reducing vehicle trips. But we're also proposing a blue bike station on site um, to address project and existing demands for short-term short and shared bike usage. 
Uh, the covered bike parking located in the garage would be weather protected and secure. And both of those recommendations are consistent with the town of Arlington's recommendations for TDM measures. We're also proposing an on-site transportation coordinator to promote sustainable transportation and, and promote the use of, or encourage the use of bicycle, pedestrian and transit uh, services. Uh, also looking to provide transportation information packets to new residents that'll identify what some of the sustainable and alternative transportation modes are in the area. And we're looking at providing a transit screen installation in the lobby, which, which provides accurate real-time information for transit, the blue bike station and Uber Lyft services in the area. Um, as far as our next steps, we're working with Beta Group to address their comments and concerns, uh, some of which were echoed by the Arlington TAC. Uh, we have reviewed operations at the bikeway and Brooks Avenue traffic signals with Lake Street. Um, we have provided some information on the mode split question. Um, there's some other questions related to the walking path from the site to L Life Station and some of the bicycle and pedestrian volume adjustments, just to name some of those uh, some of those outstanding items. We are also working with town engineering and DPW to identify potential mitigation measures to address existing access issues with those side streets of the neighborhood. And um, where we sort of have a, a you know, part of the part of the town staff is is uh, is on board with the idea of of what we're proposing, um, and we want to make sure that the entire um, town staff uh, that we're working with is in favor and supports the, the, uh, our proposals before we actually show them to the public. Um, and then any, any other outstanding comments that, that come up will be sure and address as well. And sorry for rushing, but that's it for the, for the traffic presentation. But I know you have a lot to get through and it's been a late night already, so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thornton. Um, you had mentioned, um, I think also seeing that seeing the beta report and the, the report from the Transportation Advisory Committee, um, there was also on Friday, a memo that came out from the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development that included some comments in regard to transportation. I just wanted to make sure you were in receipt of that. Yes, yes, sir, we are. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the board before we have beta? Mr. Revlak. Yes, uh, uh, a question for Mr. Thornton on the, uh, the slide before project mitigation. Um, there was mention of a 60 to 64 percent change, and I'm, I, didn't, I didn't quite get um, what is, what does that change apply to? So that's just based on the, um, the trip estimation from the previous uh, project compared with the current project. Okay. And was that change a, an increase or a decrease? It was a decrease. So okay. just so to it, be clear. <laughs> yes, no, that's appreciate the question. So, uh, so in, uh, in 2014, when the initial study was prepared, uh, they were looking at a larger development, which generated more traffic on just on its own. They also were looking at um, uh, smaller uh, percentages of, of traffic expected to use uh, the transit uh, services in the area. And again, that's, that was from 2010. With the 2019 data that we have, uh, the transit usage has gone up and also the, the development size, the, the development's been downsized from what was, uh, what was proposed initially. It's down 41 units. So that accounts for the 60 to 64 per 64% reduction in vehicle trips. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Other questions from the board? Seeing none, I'm going to... Um, Ms. Nover, I don't know if you want to take over? Or... 
Hi, Mr. Chairman. Um, Greg Lucas from Beta is going to be presenting um, our comments on the traffic tonight. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I won't. I, I don't. I don't have a formal presentation. I'll summarize. You know where we're at at this point, and and echo some of the things that um, that Mr. Thornton had had stated. So we had an opportunity to provide review comments, um, which and we've had a couple discussions uh, with with Vanas, with the town, with the TAC about um, some of the details of those comments. And I, I won't go through every every single every single piece of that, but. Generally, it fell into kind of three categories. One was making sure that we've accurately identified um, pet and bike connections between the site. Uh, it sounds like there isn't anything proposed that uses the um, undeveloped portion of the site that access would be via Dorothy Road. Um, and also that um, recreational activity was accurately captured um, in the area. The other is the mode split question, and and Scott explained the um, the initial discussion to use the Voxon two uh, mode split because it was similar in nature, similar in location, um, a similar type of residential development, and and as we look closer at those numbers, um, we realize, and and some of that was explained in in Scott's presentation that um, you know the walk trips maybe aren't as appropriate for this site for Thorndike Place versus Voxon 2, because Voxon 2 is closer to other, um, uh, you know, uh, other office and shopping. And so there may be a greater percentage of walk trips there that, don't, that wouldn't necessarily occur uh, from Thorndike Place. And then um, the third was specific impacts to the Dorothy Road neighborhood, especially uh, during construction. And we just discussed this recently um, with the town and with Vanass. And, and, and there, I think we still need to understand what kind of construction activity will be necessary, what kind of construction vehicles will be used, the size, the frequency of those vehicles um, to access this site, uh, to, to build this, to do the earthwork that's necessary, and what that impact would be, both specifically for trucks to be able to access the roadways connecting to the site and also what that impact would be on the neighborhood. So that's something that was in our, um, in our review letter that still is, still is outstanding. But otherwise, uh, most everything we've had an opportunity to discuss both directly with Vanass and with the town and with the TAC um, and, and are coming to some agreement on those other outstanding issues. Thank you. Are there questions from the board at this point? No? If not, then I'd like to- May I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. O'Rourke. For either Mr. Thornton or Mr. Lucas, um, for those who don't understand these reports, but have sat uh, on Lake Street in bumper to bumper traffic uh, evenings from um, Route 2 to Mass Ave, is there anywhere in the data you can show us that supports that? I mean, you know, so we can get a sense on what these, what the baseline on these reports are um, to show the significant traffic that's already there pre-COVID in terms of traffic counts or anything like that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can, I can jump in on that. So, so we have, so we conducted some, um, we had some data that was out there on Lake Street at either end uh, that, was, that was older, that was pre-COVID. And then uh, we didn't have any new data at these new, at these intersections of, um, you know, say Homestead or Little John or, um, or Margaret or Birch. We, did, we had to go and collect that data. And um, we, th there's procedures that have been identified by mass dot to adjust volumes that are collected during covid to to pre-covid levels and we took a look at those at those measures and found and when we applied them we found that they weren't we weren't they weren't really generating um enough of a enough of a adjustment to 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 make it reasonable um and the the, the adjustments were actually too low we felt so 
So we looked at um, mass DOT permanent count station data from prior to COVID from, from last year, as well as this year, found adjustment factors, applied that to the traffic volumes that we collected and then balanced upwards to, to, uh, to come up with what we feel is, is a representation of 2020 traffic volumes. And we did do, we did do the analysis of the, of the traffic uh, operations at those intersections and it does show you know level of service f for for which is you know as bad as it gets for for movements exiting uh, those side streets um, and you know initially we had uh, we, we had some uh, information for the bikeway traffic signal which was under construction at the time of our counts um, and uh, uh, the signal at the, the new signal at Brooks Ave. And we had developed some, some analysis based on, uh, based on the timings that we had. And then we went, you know, in response to comments from Beta and the TAC, we took another look at that analysis. And it, it really showed, because the TAC in particular uh, noted that the the results in the traffic study for those intersections were too good uh, and, and weren't, weren't really representative. So we went and took another look at the, at the timing, uh, the signal plans and found that uh, when, we, when we revised the analysis, it actually did, did look, I think the morning was, the morning was um, one of the time periods was much worse than what we initially had projected. And I think that's, that's more representative of of the conditions out there, um, but I don't know, Greg, if there's if there's anything you wanted to add on that. Yeah, I would I would just you know confirm that you know the the study does accurately capture the existing pre COVID operations of Lake Street. It does show um, level service F. It shows queuing and and the one. Um, the one area, as, as Scott had mentioned, that um, at the bikeway and at the, the Brooks Ave intersection where there was something that didn't quite seem right. And so it sounds like that's been worked out. But in general, yes, it does show, it, it, it does show um, traffic operational um, issues along Lake Street. If we're talking overall, and forgive the um, uneducated questions, a minimal increase in traffic, is it, is it fair to say that we're taking a situation that's already difficult, and making it um, by the um, you know, Scott's report uh, worse, but just minimally worse. Is that kind of the bottom line? If you were to generalize this, yeah, I, and I think that the um, in a, in addition, we're we're trying to uh, come up with other measures and other ways to address what's already <laughs> out there with the. With the cues and the backups, um, I, I think there's, you know, there to some extent we're limited to what we can do. We can't, um, we can't widen Lake Street, and we can't discourage people from from finding alternate routes whenever there's um, congestion on Route 16. And Lake Street is always going to be used as as a as some type of cut through route to avoid a lot of that a uh, lot of that congestion. But I think if we can if we can work to make it a little easier for that neighborhood at least to to, to access get in and out of uh, of Lake Street, I think that that's that would that would mitigate the impact that our project would have on Lake Street. Thank you. And one more question uh, because it's come up in the past, but a lot of people who don't come to all the meetings, I, I continue to have the question. Why hasn't the project been able to get some sort of separate cut in entrance from Route Two to the project directly? Yeah, and I think that um, there's a whole host of issues that that comes up with that. Um, it's logistically first off, it's it's going through environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, second, there's uh, design issues with elevation changes. Um, you'd be you'd be decelerating to come into the site at the same point you'd be accelerating uh, to 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 come from Route 16 onto Route 2. Uh, if you provided access from the ramp, DOT is not 
is not a big fan of that. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's not as, you know, just because we're, we abut the highway doesn't mean we can necessarily connect to the highway. Yeah, I would agree. Our, our expectation was that um, given the, you know, the size, the size of the development, it, it was unlikely that MassDOT would ever entertain a direct connection to the highway ramp or to the highway itself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Uh, follow a follow up question for Mr. Lucas. Uh, when you said the development wasn't a size of a size that um, MassDOT would consider ac direct access to Route Two, does that mean size too big or size too small? Size too small. Size too small. I think it would have to be a much, uh, you know, a much higher amount of traffic generated to justify a direct connection to the to the highway infrastructure. And again, that's just my that's just my speculation. I don't we we haven't had as far as I know, there may have been discussions way back when with MassDOT, but none recently. And I think that although that was part of the 2014 study, it entertained that option as a potential. Um, I don't think that it was a realistic option then or now. I agree with that. Mr. Mills? Yes, uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Thornton. In regards to demographics at a site, would you consider that um, apartments that included children would generate more trips per day? I think that's probably accurate, yeah. Okay, further question then. Has anybody assessed the uh, populations in Arlington's apartments uh, for the percentage of families with children? I, I know that we, we don't have that information. Because I asked that question, uh, in my experience as a town meeting member, it came up in conversation quite some time ago that one of our members who was a member of the school committee at the time indicated that there had been an increase in the population or the demographics in the apartment house that included families with children. So I'm just wondering if this uh, development could result in heavier traffic than we're anticipating based on that. And I think it's a fair question to ask if anybody can find out what the demographics are of the apartment houses in Arlington. And if these f include children in significant numbers. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, I would. Uh, Perhaps, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, just to understand where that information might fit, uh, the basic traffic generation here comes from the ITE figures, and ITE figures presumably are based upon some kinds of studies or surveys that provide data of traffic generation from buildings of certain kinds. Um, so before we actually know what the implications would be of more or fewer children uh, in Arlington apartments or in apartments near transit centers, which also might be systematically different from uh, uh, from apartments generally. Uh, don't we have to know what the assumptions were in the ITE numbers? Without that, how could you make an adjustment? Yeah, and I th I think that um, and we don't know that we don't have that information. That's not available in the in the ITE manual. The ITE manual is is a collection of of, of statistics and uh, counts of similar facilities um, that have been reduced and compiled uh, into equations or rates uh, based on different different variables. It could be it could be seats at a restaurant. It could be number of of vehicle fueling pumps at a gas station. It could be number of units at an apartment building. But it doesn't it doesn't get so detailed as to say. Um, you know, there were a pro, you know, 1.3 children uh, in residence at each, at each unit. But the, um, 
the best that we could do is is really report on um, and I, I think we'd have to contact the, the the town planning staff to see if this information exists uh, but we would all we could really do is find out what the numbers of children might be in these apartment houses. And from there, I don't know what we would do with that data. I don't know how we would apply it to the, to the, to the ITE numbers. Thank you. I would like to um, introduce the, the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, um, ask him if he, to address us with, um, uh, in regards to the meeting that they held last month. Oh, but you're on mute. I thought I had unmuted myself. Um, Howard Mews, chair of the TAC. Uh, we conducted a review of both the TIA for the project and uh, the beta um, review of uh, the peer review that they did for the town. And uh, our review is from our executive committee because th the timing of how all this fell did not allow us to be able to take it to a full committee. Uh, <clears throat> the executive committee basically concurs with pretty much all of the comments made in the beta uh, report. Uh, however, we did add a few of our own uh, and I just like to highlight a few of those. We did suggest that the pro pro proponent consider providing subsidized MBTA passes as part of the proposed transportation demand management program. Uh, they can be effective in encouraging people to use transit rather than driving. Uh, we also raised a question about the number of parking spaces. By S our calculations, there's 1.3 parking spaces per unit, which the executive committee felt was awfully high for a project that's basically a transit oriented development. Uh, and we re recommended that the Board of Appeals uh, look into the possibility of perhaps reducing the requirement for the number of parking spaces. One of our other major comments had to do with um, the level of service analysis at Brooks Avenue and at the Minuteman Bikeway. The TAC undertook a study several years ago of Lake Street, and one of its major recommendations was to install the signal at the bikeway and coordinate it with the existing signal at Brooks Ave. When we did that study, uh, we estimated what the impact would be on Lake Street in future conditions. And we found some improvement in queuing along Lake Street, but nothing that matched what was in the TIA, which showed that eastbound or going towards Mass Ave approach uh, being at level of service A, both in the morning and in the evening with the signal installed and with the future build volumes. So we've strongly suggested that that needs to be reanalyzed because we never anticipated based on our recommendation that there would be that kind of improvement in traffic on Lake Street. Uh, and we also ask that the operation analysis be expanded to include a discussion of queuing on Lake Street at the bikeway and Brooks Ave. Uh, level of service is one measure of what's going on, but queuing is also another measure of the extent of congestion and the time of, that people might have to wait to get through the signal. Uh, we also had three comments that uh, Beta made that we uh, especially stressed and uh, added our comments one had to do with the turning restrictions, which we've discussed uh, on from Lake Street onto Wilson Ave, Little John and Homestead Road. The traffic analysis uh, distributed or assigned traffic trips 
as if those restrictions did not exist. And yet the report does not make any recommendation with respect to changing those restrictions. Uh, we feel strongly that the report should uh, be amended to show how traffic would get in and out of the site and be consistent with the traffic uh, restrictions at those intersections. Those inter restrictions are there to prevent cut through traffic uh, through the neighborhood. Um, and uh, we think that we need to take a close look at that. We can't just say that people are gonna violate those term restrictions. Uh, we also um, endorse the idea of doing a detailed study of construction, uh, particularly impacts on Dorothy Road and uh, Little John. And in conjunction similar to that, we also thought it was important to look at the project impacts, that is final traffic conditions on the Dorothy Road neighborhood and other streets leading into that area. Uh, the town did a test of some traffic calming measures on um, uh, actually uh, Dorothy Road and uh, Mary Street. And it's, um, it may be important that based on impacts from this development that some consideration be given to uh, installing traffic calming measures on some of the neighborhood streets. Uh, thank you, that's it. Thank you very much. Additional questions from the board? All right, Mr. Revelak. Uh, just one, um, and I, this would be a question for Mr. Muse, and I'm just trying to make sure that you know, my, I'm remembering things correctly. Uh, I Regarding the turn restrictions onto some of the uh, side streets from Lake where the uh, TIA showed turn counts where there was a turn prohibition, um, am I correct in remembering that those were mainly those that were just measured numbers. In other words, that's people were turning regardless of the restriction. In, in looking at existing conditions, there are some people who make those turns if you do a count at the location. It's not a very large number because there is periodic enforcement of mm. those restrictions. Uh, but the distribution or the assignment of the project trips to the roadway basically ignored that restriction and had people turning from Lake Street onto Little John, despite the fact that that restriction is there. And I think that conflict needs to be resolved somehow. Okay, so you, you'd like the, the projections to, you'd like projections that assume that the uh, turn restrictions are adhered to? If they're adhered to, that means more of the traffic will uh, travel further on Lake Street and then turn at uh, either Birch or Margaret to get into the project. So it would, would have an impact on Lake Street traffic. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I wondered if, if Mr. I mean, this would be a good time for uh, Mr. Thornton to indicate whether he agrees or disagrees with Mr. Muse on the on the appropriateness or the the need to take into consideration the existing restrictions on um, on the right turn there, or those turns. Sure. So, init the initial study uh, looked at traffic. As I mentioned, we we did collect traffic counts at those at those intersections um, where both the ones where there are entering turn restrictions and where there are, are none. And we found that, um, that some of the, uh, whether there were restrictions there or not, uh, vehicles were, were still entering those streets from Lake Street. 
Um, and, and that was reflected in the traffic analysis. In the, in the subsequent analysis, we have revised those traffic volumes to, to adhere to uh, the turn restrictions. Uh, in terms of what is likely to happen, I, you know, I would, I would think that there will be some component of traffic that will, uh, that will still travel uh, the most direct route, the most logical route, uh, which would, which would be to enter at Little John. Um, I think that that's just human nature. Uh, at the same time, we we understand the validity of the of the turn restrictions and the prohibitions for entering movements. Um, we're not advocating the removal of them, um, and and I, I think that the the analysis that or the revised analysis would be uh, more conservative by adding traffic to you know directing that traffic to enter the site and travel further on Lake Street to get into the site. Uh, Mr. The, the issue, if I understand it, is that understanding where the people are going to turn and exactly where that flow is will have an impact on how one might design various measures to deal with the traffic going through the local neighborhoods. That, I mean, it's essentially a question of, of understanding what the threat to the neighborhood is to understand where the defense is. Is, is that basically what we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in my opinion, I think it is. I think that, um, you know, there's, there, there are some measures that can be implemented for, for traffic calling purposes. I think if, if we, it, you know, if, if we were to, um, for instance, um, uh, identify some type of, of traffic calming devices for Margaret Street, um, I think that that could address existing uh, conditions that may occur with traffic that, that wants to get back to uh, Thorndike Field um, and could also address the impact of, of additional traffic from this development that, would, that, that may use Margaret Street. Conversely, you could have, you could have an increase in traffic on Little John Street um, for entering movements that would be, you know, that, that you might miss, um, but it, by by uh, suggesting that that traffic isn't going to enter at Little John and will and will instead uh, obey the turn restrictions and come in at Birch or or Margaret, I think it's just, you know, it's it it's not a um, I don't think it's an either or situation. I think it's something that we need to probably spend a little more time studying it with, with ATTAC and with uh, BETA and with uh, DPW and engineering as well to make sure that, that whatever, we, whatever designs we come up with there are appropriate and will address what, what people's concerns are. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have one more question. This is for Mr. Muse. I, I, I noticed that the TAC hearing uh, must be almost a month ago now. Uh, there was a few minutes spent discussing um, the possibility of providing some sort of access across the pedestrian bridge across Route 2. That came up subsequently in a conversation with the Conservation Commission. And I noticed that I, we haven't heard about that tonight, or at least I missed it if we have. And I was wondering whether that's an idea that is in play or whether it's been resolved one way or the other, whether that's possible or not. Uh, we, we did have discussion of that. A um, couple of issues involved is the condition of the overpass itself. Um, I don't think it's in very good condition. It may be safe, but I don't think it's a pleasant way to cross Route 2. The other issue would be getting people from the site where the building is across to Route 2. Uh, because of all the wetlands in there and other uh, uh, open space, it may be difficult to identify a pathway across there. And then it would be questionable about how many people would use it to cross over that bridge. Uh, obviously, bicycles would still have to use the Minuteman bikeway. 
And um, I think that a lot of, most pedestrians would probably can go down Dorothy to the Minuteman bikeway. Yeah, and, and if I could just follow up on that, um, uh, Mr. Hanlon, uh, we're not proposing any access through those those undeveloped areas, either either to that uh, that pedestrian overpass on Route Two, or to uh, directly to the bikeway. Thank you. I did take a specific trip to the overpass to try it out um, last spring, and um, while it is intact, um, there are definitely holes, and the the steps are surprisingly steep. Uh, so it's really not a very, unfortunately, not a very usable, um, a usable bridge. So I had a question about um, about the the traffic counts and just sort of try to try to sort of figure out a little bit. Um, so currently, feeding Little John Street, if you sort of go a half a block each way off of Little John. There's about 71 um, dwelling units that effectively feed onto that street, um, and then and by the you know using the the no build in the morning that generates 24 people turning left off of Little John and six people turning right off of Little John on the lake. Um, in the build condition, that 71 units is increased to 247 units, um, and the counts are increased to 37 turning left and it's still the same six turning right um, while the amount of units is almost three and a half times what it was before and so I just wanted to get a, a sense from you as to sort of where this kind where this kind of an analysis um, you know doesn't isn't an accurate reflection of how things should be because it, you know looking at it if we're you know, the, using the neighborhood as a sampling for how traffic moves and who drives and who doesn't drive. Um, why is that not a good model? Yeah, and, and I think we, um, we assumed that uh, some, some portion of traffic, you know, that's, that wanted to head out to Route 2 and wanted to head to Points West would make that left turn from Little John. Whereas traffic that wanted to, to turn right and head out towards uh, Mass Ave would actually go through Dorothy and then out to Margaret Street and make the right turn at, at, um, at Lake Street, either from, from Margaret or, or from Birch. And I think the idea there is th that, um, you know, that's, that's what traffic would, would do to avoid uh, any queuing that might that might occur on Lake Street. So, the, so those excess trips are just moving through the adjacent neighborhood rather than coming straight out and, and on the lake. Yeah, and, and, and again, I, I think it's, um, you know, every day might be a little different. You might have, um, you know, there might be an increase in the right turn movement of, of of zero vehicles one day, and it might be a, an increase of, of 10 or 12 vehicles uh, another day. But I think that, that in general, um, the traffic that, that, would, that would choose to get out to Route 2 would come right, come directly out to out Little John, and traffic that would go out to Mass Ave would most likely cut through Dorothy Road to Margaret Street. Okay. Um, and I don't know if this is a it's not you know, particular to transport to uh, to traffic, but in a transportation thought, um, has there been any thought to on site how to handle visitor traffic um, and visitor parking in particular? Um, you know, there the allocate the current allocation for parking is kind of high, but you know, with a high density of people and you know the expectation that at some point we're going to be able to have people come over again. Um, there will be, you know, probably a fair number of visitor trips, and I just want to sort of get a sense as to whether the the parking related to that is going to be absorbed on site or if it's going to be absorbed back in the neighborhood. 
Yeah, I think that we'll probably uh, we can we can take a look at that to see if there's um, um, if, if we should if we can designate some of the spaces in the front of the building, for instance, for or visitors. Um, but that's that's a good question. That's something that we can look at. Okay, appreciate that. Other questions from the board at this point. Mr. O'Rourke. Uh, either, Mr. Mr. Thornton, um, in terms of when you do these assessments, do you look at all on the ability of emergency vehicles to access the area um, based on the traffic data, particularly the peak hours, or is that something that's kind of, you can extrapolate from the data you already have, or do we get that information from some other source through this process on the ability of emergency vehicles to access, particularly during the peak hours? Uh, it's it's not something that we that we typically uh, review or typically look at. Um, we do we do note that uh, the the general physical dimensions of of the road are if they're large enough that the traffic can, if for particular on a on a two lane road, if traffic can um, can move to either side to permit emergency vehicles to get through. Um, but, uh, but in, you know, in, in general, in, in, there are some times when, um, when emergency vehicles, you know, really create their own path by, by moving congestion and moving traffic out of the way. And I guess just one final point. When you do these assessments, a question for you, Mr. Thornton or Mr. Lucas, and you look at a situation like this with, you know, Lake Street feeding this neighborhood and getting congested, when you look at the traffic counts, have, do you ever get to a point and say, you know, X number is just not feasible? It's simply not feasible in, you know, in, in what you do as expert work. And if so, you know, is that number something that's calculable here? Yeah, I think I, I think if you if you get to the point where um, where there's where there's, you know, gridlock and and congestion everywhere and traffic is not able to, to turn into any of the side streets, um, then, uh, then you know, the, the, the locate, the streets are, are at capacity. Um, that where, where the increases from this development are, are, you know, a handful of trips, you know, a trip every, every couple minutes uh, during the peak hours, uh, we're not at that point with this development. I, I would agree with that. There's, you know, in some instances, there's a sensitivity analysis that can be done to find that tipping point. Um, this, the minimal amount of traffic that's projected to be generated doesn't, doesn't meet that threshold. And even in a congested, in a congested, heavily traveled um, network, those relatively low numbers will be absorbed into that with little um, you know, little discernible impact. I, I would also say that, that, you know, for developments that are, um, where the density is a little higher and where they're located close to alternative transportation, uh, near, you know, within a quarter mile of a, of a, of a major transit station, you know the the development itself is the mitigation because just by locating the just by its location that development is going to be reducing traffic outside of the area because traffic wants to come in and you know the regional traffic wants to come into this area these these residents and the traffic associated with these units doesn't is going to have a number of options it doesn't have to they don't have to, to use personal vehicles. They, they, they're going to, there's, it, there's really going to be, uh, I think, a, a draw for, for, for residents that are looking at alternative transportation, that want to be able to bike to work, that want to be able to, to use transit, that want to be able to walk to, to the red line um, 
and and walk the other way into into shops in town, and um, and that's that's the type of you know those are the types of of developments and the the type of of planning uh, that really helps to to reduce the the regional congestion and and starts to starts to make a dent in in the congestion on the the major regional roadways. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions from the board? This time, Mr. Revelak. Uh, a question for Mr. Muse. Uh, earlier, you said that um, you know, the TAC had looked at the number of parking spaces and the number of units and calculated approximately 1.3 spaces per unit, which I believe you said you felt that it was rather high. Just mm -hmm. out of curiosity, what, you know, what kind, what would you have considered a number that would be not high? Uh, the executive committee was uh, thinking of something in the range of one space per unit, uh, given that uh, there's a high percentage of people either walking, biking, or using transit. Uh, I would, as Scott was saying, people would be attracted to living in this development uh, if they didn't particularly have uh, if they didn't even want a car, or certainly if they only wanted one car, uh, because they can use, most people don't want to have more cars than they need to get around. And a quick brief follow up for Mr. Thornton. Um, so trip generation is based on the number of units or the number of parking spaces. Number of units. You start, so you, number of units is your starting point. Thank you. Yes. Um, so another another issue um, in this neighborhood um, and adjacent neighborhoods is uh, people coming into the neighborhood during the day to find daytime parking on the street um, and avoid paying the rates at Alewife. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily really a question, but just to put it forward to the the applicant that. Um, that's a known issue, and that is something that they may want to consider. Um, should the should the project go forward, uh, is how to how to address um, daytime drop-ins. That it, it's a good point. It's something that I've I've noticed when I've uh, gone to the neighborhood to to for site visits, mm -hmm. um, and it it's something that we'll take a look at when uh, you know when when we're evaluating how to, how to structure parking and how to, you know, the, the parking is going to be uh, reserved for, for, for residents. And uh, like I mentioned, there might be some small visitor parking area, but that's, that's it. Okay. Other, other, other questions from the board? Mr. Mills. <clears throat> Again, in regards to the parking, uh, there's a recommended from the traffic advisory committee of one space per apartment uh, unit. Is that units or bedrooms? That's units. Um, we don't know what, well, I don't think we know what the bedroom mix is in the development. Uh, I think that's Scott a very might. relative parameter. Mm -hmm. How many bedrooms are going to be constructed? Mr. Thornton, do we know that figure? I think we do. Um, I mean, the as my recollection is that the the parking, um, the number of parking spaces provided uh, was calculated to be in compliance with our yes. current zoning rules, and which do base parking requirements for apartments uh, upon the number of bedrooms. Thank you, Steve. Okay. All right. Well, at this point, um, uh, before I open it up to public comment, um, I just want to address a, a topic that had come up earlier, um, and specifically how we address it. So there was a question about uh, whether we felt that there was a higher number of uh, potential families with children um, living in the development, and whether that would impact 
uh, the traffic um, on the site. And um, just to sort of reiterate that uh, under federal and state guidelines that families are a protected class in regards to residences. And so um, it is never appropriate to, uh, uh, you know, to just uh, to distinguish out families and to, in some way to, um, to make them feel uncomfortable in the development. But in, the re in regards to this discussion, um, I felt it was important that um, we discuss making sure that the traffic counts are accurate um, and that would be impacted by uh, the possible mix of ages um, in the development. But in regards to other aspects of the project, um, the fact that there's families versus um, non-families in the residences is not a topic um, that we can entertain at all. Um, so thank you. With that, um, if you are signed in through Zoom um, from the participants tab, you can use the raise hand feature to uh, draw attention to yourself. Um, if you are calling in by phone, you can use star nine to uh, accomplish the same thing. Um, and if you are just on the screen, um, I will do my very best to try to find you uh, waving frantically. Um, but on the list, um, I do the first person uh, is uh, Jeff Maxidis. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Jeff Maxidis. I'm also um, the vice chair of the TAC. So I was involved in the executive um, committee review of the project. So I just wanted to add on the on the parking issue, why the um, why we commented on the one point uh, one space per unit, um, because it is the current thinking of MAPC. They have a recent a study that was done within the last two years um, oh. called uh, the right fit or perfect fit parking, and it was done primarily for communities within the one twenty eight um, Boston metro area. And Arlington was part of that study, which had a couple uh, sample um, sites within that study. And really the recommendation um, of MAPC of, uh, for communities in the Metro Boston area, particularly transit oriented developments that, um, you know, parking space um, shouldn't be looked at as minimums anymore, like a lot of parking zoning regulations are, but as maximums. And in this area, parking maximums of uh, one uh, one space per unit um, that that should be the maximum, or it could even be lower. A lot of people living in multi-family units these days don't want to have many vehicles and don't want to pay for parking if they're not using those spaces. So um, that's you know our that's where our suggestion or recommendation came from. So it wasn't. Um, it was, was based on our, our collective judgment in transportation um, working in the industry, but it was also based on the recent MAPC report um, talking about um, developments ex exactly li like this development is. Thank you. Thank you. Do not see any other names on the board. Now looking at the pictures, everyone, see if anyone is trying to gain attention. Ah. Um, Lisa Friedman, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, it's Lisa Fredman, and Fredman, I live at six, not a problem. I live at 63 Mott Street, which is essentially in a butter to the um, development. And I'd like to make a couple of comments as someone who actually moved to this neighborhood because of the proximity to the T. I found out very quickly when I was working in Boston that it was unsafe for me to walk to the T at night. And so I ended up driving there or driving to the garage. I think there will be a lot of people like that as well. And what that means, and what my experience is, is that instead of turning right onto Lake Street during rush hour, you turn left onto Lake Street. 
You turn left onto Lake Street from Wilson, Dorothy, Birch, and Margaret. And then you speed up as quickly as you can to get to Route 2. It is a hazard to drive left onto Lake Street during rush hour. And at the moment, and I have a really hard time believing that there are only one to four cars that are in line to move onto Lake Street during rush hour, because before the pandemic, when I drove onto Lake Street, there were always at least four cars in front of me on Wilson Street, not on Dorothy Street. And people on Lake Street do not stop so you are just a sitting duck and I'm always concerned that I'm going to get rear-ended. And in fact, the comparison to Voxon 2 ignores the multiple traffic accidents that have happened on Route 2 since Voxon 2 was developed. And I think that that would be really important to notice. I also am kind of a little bit upset that the developers and the town haven't reached out to those of us who are neighbors because a lot of us have been worried about this development. We've been participating in as, as many meetings as we can to give you our opinions. Um, we understand that there has to be development even though many of us are kind of appalled that it's gonna be on a wetland. And so I would really encourage you to talk with us because I think all of us can give you very personal experiences in terms of the traffic impact and the traffic experiences that we have right now. Someone said earlier something about the development being a threat to the neighborhood. I think it will be a threat to the neighborhood and it will be a threat to anyone who's driving either way on Lake Street. Thank you. Thank you. Matt McKinnon, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, good evening. Uh, I just wanted a clarification on Sorry, what I- If you could just give your name and address for the record, please. Sure, my name is Matt McKinnon and I live on 9 Little John Street. Thank you. And I wanted a clarification on what I thought I heard um, where they talked about not changing the existing signage on Lake Street uh, where there's a, an exemption that you may not turn right onto uh, Little John, which is currently uh, talked about as the driveway into the uh, proposed uh, development. Um, but to continue on uh, two more blocks to take our right onto Birch Street and then continue on into the, the development. Did I hear that correctly? Mr. Thurman? No. Mr. Thornton, can you address that question? You're on mute. I Sorry, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't okay. unmute myself. Yeah. Um, so, so right. So the 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 current the revised traffic analysis does assume that the prohibition would would be in place. Um, we're not recommending any changes to it, and that that traffic would head down to Birch Street to uh, to access the development. Okay. So then they would snake back down Mary Street before taking a left onto Little John Street or take some number of different spidery ways into the development? Yeah, yeah, they would, they would, uh, you know, they could come to, to Mary, to Dorothy or, or to, you know, to some combination of streets to get back to the development. So it seems kind of like chaos to me if, I, you know, um, a bunch of different cars taking different routes um, presently, there's uh, no restrictions on parking on either side of the street, on uh, any of the streets in the community, except when you get closer to um, the parking area for the soccer fields, um, where there is a restriction uh, uh, for parking um, if you're going to take public transportation. Uh, but nobody really follows that. We get people parking from, you know, coming to find parking to park there to either use the bike path or to go to air life without paying parking fees. Um, so you get people parking on both sides and it, you know, uh, there are small streets that really cramps things. So I think having, uh, you know, more people in the neighborhood, 
more cars, more vehicular traffic, uh, parking, uh, driving, you know, in both directions with people also wanting to go to air life without paying for parking, uh, people who want to use, uh, you know, the bike path. Um, and if you have people parking on both sides of the road, you kind of have to snake through uh, the, this neighborhood. Um, if, you know, two people are parked uh, on one side, uh, directly across from each other, it's very hard to snake through. Um, and in fact, if somebody's parked in front of my driveway, I can't exit my driveway uh, unless, you know, they give me some space. Um, if you look at Nine Little John and, and come out here and, you know, park directly in front of my driveway, but across the street, and then have me try to exit my driveway, um, it'd be very difficult. So I'm wondering, you know, are there going to be existing changes made to the streets uh, that connect this development uh, to say whether they're going to be one way, uh, changes to, you know, the direction of the streets or if there's going to be some limitations on whether people can park on both sides of the street. Uh, you know, it just seems like there's a lot of uh, traffic considerations that should be made uh, that aren't being thought about. Well, thank you for that. Um, I guess I would ask Mr. Mr. Muse, is that something that the town considers as a part of development sometimes, the changes to either the directionality of streets or the on-street parking access? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, that would be part of looking at whether uh, transfer, uh, excuse me, um, traffic calming measures might be put in. Uh, you might be able to allow people to turn on to um, turn in, but then have traffic calming measures on like Dorothy Street or Mary Street uh, so people don't cut through the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, and part of that could be looking at making segments of some of the streets one way. Uh, using parking does slow traffic down and a lot of times people like that uh, when they feel the traffic is speeding through their neighborhood. Uh, there are a number of different measures that could be looked at and uh, and we haven't we, we haven't done anything to suggest what those might be although there was an experiment on Mary Street earlier this year uh, testing out some measures uh, that might turn into a more permanent approach to uh, reducing cut through and cutting speeds through that area. Yes, can I comment on that, please? Mr. McGinn, please. Yes, so if the traffic calming uh, uh, test that happened over the summer um, were to be in place uh, more permanently, and people are coming to take a right off of Lake Street onto Birch, Birch Street, um, they'll hit that traffic calming, uh, you know, setup, which would probably force them down, uh, you know, the next route that they could take, which would then, you know, cause traffic to flow in a different way through the neighborhood than it usually doesn't, which would then impact, you know, neighbors that might not be used to that sort of traffic. Uh, we mm -hmm. saw this happen when we put up that traffic calming thing. Uh, people would think the road was closed and they would go and flow down all the way down Little John Street uh, when they were trying to, you know, connect up to, uh, I'm not thinking of, uh, you know, when they're trying to flow through the neighborhood and they and bypass Lake Street and they see that traffic calming thing, they think the road is closed, they, they ended up flowing, you know, two more blocks down uh, onto, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a map in front of me. I'm forgetting the, the route name, uh, Dorothy, Dorothy Street. So the traffic calming uh, measures made the people on Mary Street super happy, but then people would be forced, uh, you know, pseudo forced down Little Don John Street onto Dorothy Street uh, and the neighbors on Dorothy Street were you know, upset because they weren't used to that sort of traffic that the neighbors, uh, neighborhood, uh, residents on Mary Street were you know, used to and had complained about a lot in the past. Um, 
so would we need traffic calming on Dorothy Road as well? And you know, what, what kind of impact would that have uh, on the development? Thank you. Uh, Robert DiBiase. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Robert DiBiase, 29 Little John Street, direct a butter to this project. Um, I have several concerns, one of them being that my driveway is the one that's right there at the entrance, proposed entrance to this development. What is the impact going to be to my residents here? As well as, um, Scott, you had mentioned earlier that there was a reduction in units of 41. Uh, by my calculations, it's 31 from 207 to 176. And I'm just concerned how we've got a drop of 60 to 64% change based on that. Um, you know, as many of these neighbors in this area have stated, you know, getting on and off of Lake Street is a challenge during, during any time of the day uh, in a normal type of setting, not in a COVID setting, in a normal setting. And you could be three, four cars back. And it is a challenge to get across to go east. Um, my biggest concern, I guess you would say, would be what's going to happen to this quiet little neighborhood with the kids that are usually in the street playing, whether it be street hockey or whatever, with little John and Dorothy turning into a raceway of at least 250 to 300 cars, you know, given in an afternoon. You have concerns of the neighbors, the children, and the impact to, to the whole neighborhood itself. Uh, when we've, we've been here for over 35 years, this home. Uh, abutting to this property. Nice, quiet, peaceful area. I'm the last one on the street. I have one neighbor right now. That's it. I have nobody behind me, nobody beside me on my left. And now I'm going to end up with, I don't know, 180 people plus visitors in cars in front of my home on a regular basis. And then during construction, I'm going to end up with trucks idling in front of my house from 6.30 to 6 at night. I have some major concerns about that. The property value of mine right now is gonna drop like a rock. Um, other concerns obviously would be during the winter time with snow removal as it is. You know, you look at what's going on in this neighborhood as it is, they use that corner to pile all the snow. Now it's gonna change into something totally different. Um, I feel that this whole development, you know, you look at the Vox over there, they have route two access. Well. They picked up the property from the Martinetti family. The Martinetti family had Faces Disco, they had a hotel, they had a gas station, and they had a bowler drone there. The hotel only had 60 to 80 rooms in it, and it had its own curb cut from DOT. Faces Disco had its own curb cut from DOT. Bowler drone had two curb cuts, and the gas station had one. The hotel, to me, wasn't that big. It was only 80 units, and now you're talking about 176 units that's twice the size of the hotel. To me, it would, it would seem like you would be qualifying for a curb cut from Route 2. And in terms of the egress on Route 2, it's harder to slow down to get into those parking lots than it is when you're getting on Route 2 to go west, traveling at, I think it's about 40 miles an hour is the speed limit, to turn into a new curb cut. So in my eyes, I think that the curb cut for Route 2 is actually going to solve a lot of these problems. Because as Vox has the curb cuts from Route 2, it also has the back passage of the access roads behind it. So the traffic is being mitigated in several different areas. Here we have the traffic leaving one entranceway past my home every single day. So I have some large concerns about this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, just a reminder, our meeting time's out at 10.30. We have about 15 minutes. Oh, remaining. thank you. We don't have it till midnight? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, looking at images, don't see anyone else clamoring. Um, So not seeing anyone else um, looking to comment, I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment for this evening. And I had a question for um, 
for Attorney Haverty. So as far as write up of the decision, how do we include issues in relation to traffic and transportation where they don't specifically relate to waivers? Well, you can still have conditions in your decision um, that aren't related to waivers, as long as they're the type of conditions that would typically be imposed in you know, a site plan approval decision or subdivision approval um, or anything of that nature. What I would suggest is that you have you instruct your peer review consultants to provide a list of proposed traffic conditions okay. um, that it believes would be appropriate and we can go from there. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions or comments from the board? Chairman, I have one, one thing that's just, just yes, in you. addition to what Attorney Haverty just said. Um, one of the things that is striking when you read through housing uh, uh, appeals committee uh, decisions is that individual uh, conditions that are imposed, uh, assuming that the, they would, that in the ensemble, they make the project uneconomic, which is not an assumption I'd necessarily make. Uh, but where that is the case, the town has a burden to show pretty specifically um, that there's a local need for those conditions and uh, you know it's sort of saying generally everybody knows doesn't really cut it once once you really focus in on that um, and so I just like to encourage people as they think about it our, our ourselves and our advisors uh, as we think about that to think exactly about what it is you tell a housing appeals committee if you had to defend that uh, commission what the evidence is behind it and be really pretty thorough about uh, what it is. There are a lot of things that are mentioned that are part of our hearings and so forth that if you think about them in that way, you realize that it never will enter into a defensible decision and other things where you may need to just do more thinking in order to be able to support them. So I just encourage all of us to be going through those analysis as we think about what the appropriate conditions would be to protect the local needs and how we could prove that, that they're genuinely necessary. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Okay. So at this point, um, given the hour, I think we will um, continue um, this hearing, the next scheduled date. Um, Calendar. The next scheduled date would be Tuesday, January 26th at 7.30 p.m. Um, so I move to continue um, this hearing on the comprehensive permit for the Thorndike Place development until Tuesday, January 26th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. I have a second. Thank you, Mr. Work. Um, a vote, uh, Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Work. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. Thank you. Chair with the eyes. So we are, that is continued um, until the 26th. All right. Well, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially wish to thank uh, Rick Ballarelli and Vincent Lee for their assistance in prepping and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording in the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding that the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. 
That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. To conclude tonight's meeting, I would like to ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. All those board members in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all so much for your participation tonight. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.